time up here on my mouth because I haven't got much to say. Right now, I'd like you to give a round of applause and a great welcome to Mr. Gary Hunt. Thank you. My name is Gary Hunt. I am the Outpost of Freedom. I'm going to read something by Mark Twain. In the beginning of a change, the patriot is a scarce man and brave, hated and scorned. When his cause succeeds, however, the timid join him, for then it costs nothing to be a patriot. Thank you, everybody, and here comes in the first category, because times are getting tough in this country. And those that uh, are willing to stand and speak for themselves are subject to prosecution at the hands of the federal government. I was a land surveyor in Florida for 20 years. It's an honorable profession, I think, but I enjoyed it and had a good living. In February of this year, I started a newspaper called The Outpost of Freedom. I published two editions of that paper in February. On February 28th, Simon Inez called me from Kerrville, Texas, and asked me what I was, uh, if I knew what was going on in Waco, Texas. I told him I did not. He directed me then to a television station in Dallas, and I called them and spoke to one of the reporters. I asked him what was happening, and he ran off to the monitor and kept referring to a cult outside of Waco. After he finished reading the report off the monitor and we got in a casual conversation, I asked him if he knew who the Branch Davidians were. He said, yes, they're a religious sect that's been outside of Waco for 30, 30 or 40 years. Well, he called them a cult in the news broadcast and a sect by personal knowledge. And anybody who's been around the Patriot Movement is quite aware of the word game that's played by government. I followed the story as it continued to break over that week, and then on Saturday, March 6th, I decided I had to fly out to Waco. Something was happening out there that would be significant in American history. I didn't realize at the time how significant. I thought it would be there three or four, maybe five days. As it was, I stayed there until April 22nd, 1993, three days after the fire. I think one of the greatest tragedies that's ever occurred in this country occurred on April 19th. I went back to Florida then to rebuild my survey business. I spent three weeks getting all my clients appeased, uh, getting caught up on work. And I felt compelled to go back to Waco and meet the people that I had met who had come out of the building before and after the fire. I haven't been back to Florida very much since then. I just let my survey business go. I think now the time has come for people to begin to stand for what they believe in. And that's what I've been doing traveling around the country, uh, speaking to people and going wherever the gun people are pointing guns in the wrong direction. I've been to Connecticut and New York. I'm hoping that I don't have to go to something like Waco again. But more and more, we find the government is turning their guns towards us. When I was in Waco, on uh, March 7th, there was a, a group of patriots that met down at the convention center, which is where they held the press conferences as well. We were going to try and intervene at Mount Carmel. There were about 80 people. I was told there would be 900. The idea was to go in and sit on the ground between the DATF and the people inside the church at Mount Carmel. By the time we were ready to go, there were less than 20 that were willing to do that. It was an unarmed effort. We thought the peaceful intervention might be a solution. That didn't work. On Tuesday, March 9th, Ron Engelman showed on KRLD in Dallas. I had asked Ron if he would present over the radio. We knew that the branch civilians were listening to his station who I was and why I had come to Waco. He did that, and a thought occurred to me, so I called on back. Now, I wasn't live on the radio with him. Ken Fox was. Ken is the one that's provided most of the video footage that you've seen uh, come out of Waco except on CBS and NBC. I asked Ron to ask David if he wanted to grant me power of attorney and to allow me to come into the center and speak with him and seek a peaceful solution. There was an affirmative answer by virtue of the response of the satellite antenna that moved back and forth. 
That afternoon, we went down to the uh, 2491 checkpoint in Waco, and I attempted to enter the center. I was denied access by the FBI and the ATF. We then filed a number of actions. The first was a criminal action against the DHS, the FBI, the Texas Rangers, the Texas State uh, Police, the Sheriff, and the Police Department. That case has never been heard. We attempted confessing to crimes. As I the power of the current attorney, Eric Leiter, who wrote the uh, arrest warrant that was served on the U.S. Marshals in Idaho in the Randy Weaver incident, uh, David Crash and myself confessed to the same crimes that were committed by the ATF on February 28, 1993 at Waco. The court refused to accept that confession into the record, denying us an opportunity to get before the uh, grand jury and try and get some action taken that would allow peaceful access. A fellow named Ken Burden from Las Vegas called me after I put out a couple of press releases to a few friends and back to my office in Florida and asked me to start putting out daily press releases. I began then putting out press releases. Uh, they're available over here, the entire staff from Waco, through a fax network. At the peak, we figured that over 10,000 people were receiving these press releases by, by noon the following day. They were put out every night, faxed out at night when the costs were cheaper. We even faxed them to Janet Reno, uh, Bill Benson, William Clinton, Sessions, Higgins, and Bob Rex at the ATF headquarters in uh, Waco. A few days later, I received a phone call from an attorney in Indianapolis. Her name was Linda Thompson. She asked me if she would, if she knew that by one of the releases that I was looking for a Patriot attorney to represent David Koresh and myself. Uh, she offered to come to Waco and uh, provide that assistance to us. We discussed it, and I agreed that she could come, come down and if we, if we could work together on the issue. She came down and we prepared a writ of, an emergency petition for writ of mandamus. The mandamus was to order the ATF, FBI, and all those encircling the Mount Carmel Center to allow me access to the person that I represented by virtue of the power of attorney. That was denied by the court. It was denied on the basis of something called the Erie Doctrine. The Erie Doctrine was based on the Erie versus Tompkins case in 1938. That case, it was a Supreme Court decision that determined that administrative agencies now rule this country and that you must exhaust all remedies uh, provided for an administrative agency code. The judge would not tell us what remedies we had via the administrative agencies, and we have yet to determine what they were. On April 23rd, Linda Thompson had called for an armed militia in Waco. She had asked people to come down bringing tanks, vehicles, airplanes, whatever means they had. There were a number of patriots that were trying different efforts, restraining orders, every method of legal maneuver we could to try and stop what was going on in Waco. And we felt that bringing military, a patriot military force to Waco would definitely increase the risk of the lives of those inside the center. So on the fact that which we sent out an appeal to Patriots not to bring their arms to Waco. We feel that that succeeded because only 31 people showed up for that armed event. We did have an event that day on April 3rd. Uh, about 120 people went to a road called Fraser Lane. It was on the east side of Mount Carmel Center. We strung ourselves along about a mile of road. The ATF then was forced to string their personnel along that mile of road. In fact, we stretched them so thin that the state police and the sheriff's department had to jump the fence and run back to where the ATF line was to defend that line. That was probably the only demonstration in Waco that uh, had any effect on the ATF at all. The rest were all held at the convention center and were completely non-productive. There were two reporters kicked out of press conferences during Waco. The first was a fellow named Louis Bean. He asked the question, is what's happening here in Waco indicative of the, of the imposition of a police force in the United States? The answer was no. Louis Bean was arrested at gunpoint 
and stood charges for disrupting the press conference. I think the answer to this question. The other one that was denied access to the press conference was myself on March 22nd or 21st. I was denied access to the press conference. My press credentials had been validated the previous Thursday. The denial was based on the fact that I had created disturbances, quote unquote, uh, with the FBI while I was there. One of those disturbances involved the instance of Saturday the 20th when Linda Thompson sent out a fax saying that, I, that she and I would be going into the Mount Carmel Center. And by the time we got to Satellite City, she had asked that I go into the center alone that it would be better if she stayed outside in case I were arrested and that she would be able then to defend me. I guess she forgot what happened to Michael Schroeder when he attempted to go into the center. Michael Schroeder was killed February 28th when he was shot in the back five times by ATF agents. That's a little overview of what happened outside of Mount Carmel in Waco during that period. What happened inside is a question people often ask in their head and very few straight stories. On the morning of February 28th, a fellow named Don Bums, who had been a member of the church for quite some time, was leaving the compound, or because the center. A few people said, Don, where are you going? Don looked over his shoulder and did not answer the question and continued walking away from the center. Shortly after that, a fellow named Rodriguez left the center. On the way out, he honked his horn three times and drove away. The Venice Davidians noted that across the street where Ribs Rodriguez lived, the, his roommates, the six roommates, had moved their cars down the road just a little bit to another house, away from the house that they had been living in, purporting to be students at TSTI, which is Texas State Technical Institute. Not too long after Rodriguez left, people noticed upstairs, especially the people I've spoken to mostly were upstairs, noticed some vehicles driving into the center. They ran to the windows to see what was happening. They noticed people in what appeared to be black uniforms jumping out. Two of them, two groups, had scaling ladders and were running around to the side of the building. The remaining officers went to the front of the building and took positions behind the vehicles that were parked there. All the vehicles were owned by the Davidians, or most of the vehicles. They heard some commotion downstairs and heard David go to the door and say, Hey, wait a minute, there are women and children in here. At that point, they began hearing gunfire. Their estimates were hundreds, or dozens to hundreds of rounds were fired, fired before David ran back inside and people started shouting their shooting at us. Slowly, the advanced civilians were able to find their weapons, some of them at least. When they found weapons, they had to find magazines, then they had to find bullets. One of those individuals that was going to get his gun, he had a 9mm block that held 16 rounds, had to go upstairs to what uh, was David's bedroom at one time. As he was coming back downstairs, a man in black came through the door of that room. The man in black saw him and aimed his MP5 at uh, Scott Snowy and fired a single round, hitting Scott in the wrist and then into his left wrist and then into his thigh. Scott, and using one hand, cocked his block and fired 16 rounds rapid fire into that room. Those are the holes you see coming out of the wall on the second floor at Waco. The rooftop scene. Peter Hipsman had gone to the fourth floor tower, the one that signs were hung some later. He was a good shot, and he hit one agent in the head, killing him with a single shot. And then Peter was killed with several gunshot wounds. The best of Indians chose not to pursue a fight, and almost immediately, Wayne Martin was on the phone, 911, uh, dialing 911. Wayne Martin was an attorney, and he got so I think he uh, got the 911 line, and he said there are 85 people surrounding our house. The lady handed him over to Sheriff's Deputy Lynch. Lynch had been put in the 911 headquarters, knowing what was happening that day, but expecting to respond to neighbors wondering about gunfire not to be responding to the Branch Davidians. He said, on the tapes, he seemed so much shocked when he tells the ATF later on that he has the Branch Davidians on the phone. It took about 34 minutes for the ATF, who should have been communicating with 911 all the time, to respond. We speculated as to why it took them so long to respond. The only thing that we can conclude is when they rolled into the Mount Carmel Center that morning, they anticipated a fairly simple task. That task was to go in, shoot a few people, perhaps find a few weapons to assure that they could justify their activity that day. 
and then return to the press conferences and tell how well they'd done, knowing that they had already alerted the press as to what was happening in White Dog. Instead, when they chose to kick down David Chris's door, they found the door kicked back, and the to uh, something totally unexpected happened. I think we need to think about this. David Koresh was defending every door in America when his people began fighting back against the ATF. Dick DeGrand recently has reported what he found when he was inside Mount Carmel. When he first arrived there, he noticed an extremely large car in the front door alongside all the other horns. It was about head high. Dick speculates that that, thing, that first shot fired was probably a 50 caliber sniper rifle fired from the house that Rodriguez had stayed in, in which the cars were removed from early that morning. And it was an attempt to assassinate David Koresh and fire him. That first day, Terry Jones was standing behind the door after the first few slot of bullets. He was shot in the abdomen, a very painful injury. He died later that day. Winston Blake was sitting on his cot eating French toast when he received a, gun, a gunshot wound to the head. The branch civilians later traced the projectile to holes in the wall in the water tanks outside at an upward angle, which meant the death shot could only have come from a helicopter. J.D. Wendell was shot while going up the stairs. The shot that killed her came through the roof. Peter Gent was on top of the water, uh, the water tower. His body laid on top of that tower after he was killed. It laid there seven days before the ATF would allow, or the FBI would allow, the removal of that body. Conway LeBlue, Todd McKeon, and Robert Williams all died on the rooftop as a result of injuries inflicted by Scott Snowby. Some of them might have been killed. The fatal shots might have come later uh, through the walls from the ATF's own gunfire. Stephen Wolf was killed by Peter Hipsman from the rooftop before Peter was killed. We began asking early on, who is the ATF? Why were they in Waco? We found an answer. In 1976, Public Law 94-564 was passed. It's titled the Bretton Woods Agreement Amendment. In that law, the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury is made governor of the fund, the fund being the International Monetary Fund, one of two banking entities of the United Nations. He cannot receive a paycheck from the United States. Lloyd Benson works for the United Nations. They pay his paycheck. The ATF works for Lloyd Benson. Lewis Pentagon, when he was held as a material witness, is contemplating filing an action changing his status to prisoner of war. He was later on included in the, in the superseding indictment and is now charged with conspiracy to murder federal agents and has dropped uh, the effort to make himself a prisoner of war. The security around uh, Mount Carmel Center uh, evolved that first day into a force made up of primarily the Department of Public Service, the state police, the Texas State Police, not the Texas Rangers. Some sheriff department personnel from like the police department. They were backed up by ACS personnel, but not by FBI. I'm going to pass a few pictures around to give you an idea of just exactly what the enemy was in like of. I'll hold them up and tell you what they are, and I hope you can remember when they get around. This is 2491, the checkpoint. This was six miles from Mount Carmel Center. When I asked them, why are you so far away? Why is this all the further we can go? They said, this is a crime scene. I imagine it's the largest crime scene uh, we've ever seen. In an effort to serve the criminal complaint, we served the DPS at 2491 checkpoint, and we had to go to the ATF headquarters to serve the ATF. When you see the one with, at the ATF headquarters, you begin to see that these are very young people. The ATF soldiers that I saw that reminded me very much of what I saw in Vietnam. I was an old man there. I was 20 when I went to Vietnam. These people are about that age. Some are a little older, but these pictures will show you how young and probably how idealistic and believing that they're doing a patriotic duty these people are in shooting Americans now, not Vietnamese. <laughs> Why 
when the Davidians were under siege and not trying to center, they allowed children that chose to come out, children that parents wanted their children to come out, and anybody that wanted to leave Mount Carmel to leave, nobody was ever held hostage in Mount Carmel. Many of the children were driven out in Rita Riddle's car. The car was quite operational. Her car, however, when we finally were able to get back on the property, was found with the two front tires on the front seat and the bumper laying on the ground. The children and the young men especially enjoyed going out on weekends riding motorcycles. They kept the motorcycles on a trailer. They were tied down and they were on the trailer the, that morning, February 28th. The FBI then chose to remove the motorcycles from the trailer before they drove over them with the tank. Paul Sider was away that he left that morning with his son to go to Austin to a gun show. Now the Davidians were running a business out of Montana Center, actually two. They had a body an auto repair shop for a couple of mag bags. They also had a gun business. They bought and sold legally weapons. All the weapons that are identified in the uh, search warrant, which is available here at the table, are legal. Everything that they purchased was legal. If you can go down and buy the same things they bought. Be cautious when you do. They might come after you. Paul was gone, though, and when he got back, he had been arrested. He had been charged with death are identified as a dangerous criminal and there was a shoot to kill order uh, out on Paul Sato. Paul's a very meek man, he's a uh, very nice, soft-spoken man, he's very intelligent, he's been in business for himself for quite some time, uh, he's a pleasure to talk to. He had spent years rebuilding an El Camino, I'm not sure what year it was, he had thousands of dollars in this car. The, ATF, or the FBI then chose to run over this car, his car with the tank. The Davidians had spent over $20,000 repairing them thus. They called the Silver Street Express. And they used it for the road trips when the band was playing. When you look at these pictures, you'll see a hole just above the passenger side front window of the bus. That hole was made by a tank drum. Some of the people lived in an airstream trailer. It was in good shape before the FBI got there. And there's some pictures of the inside after they were done. The number of people in Mount Carmel varied from 120 to 150 from time to time as people went to visit relatives or went back to the country of their origin and then came back. But frequently the sermons were so long it was easier to order out food than to cook for that many people. So this truck was called a food truck. It was used to go into town and buy 300 hamburgers or 150 pizzas. In this picture, you'll see bullet holes in the passenger side door. Those bullet holes go in and down to the floorboard that were shot directly from the side of the vehicle. They were not caught by gunfire coming from inside. A little white car here. This belonged to Misty Ferguson. She was the second most badly burned survivor of the fire on April 19th. Her clothes and and goods were electric stored as personal property stored it out in their cars. Her clothes were scattered all over the ground. They were mildewed by the time we were able to retrieve these clothes and get them back to where most of them were damaged beyond use. When you look at the silver streaks of dust, you might notice on some of the pictures you can see the holes in the window. The holes are elongated. They're about this large. They were made from the inside out by a rifle gun. Other random pictures of vehicles, you might note the windshields and the fronts of the vehicles. They don't have bullet holes in them. Remember, ATF was hiding behind these vehicles, but they don't have bullet holes in them. Most of the damage was caused by vandalism, by rifle butts knocking windows out, by bullets being shot through the sides of the vehicles, not through the front. The vehicles were facing the center and would have had bullet holes going parallel to the axis of the vehicle rather than from the side. And we 
all know, on April 19, 1993, there was a fire at Mount Carmel. The FBI had submitted a plan to Washington, D.C. This paperwork accompanies the video that you'll see in just a few minutes. The evaluation of the handling of the Branch Division standoff in Waco, Texas. It's the Justice Department report that you've heard about. On page 59 of that report, we get an idea of what began that morning. Sometime in mid-morning, an apparent deviation from the approved plan began. The plan had contemplated that the building would only be dismantled if, after 48 hours, not all the people had come out. Well, we heard that morning from Bob Rexes that they were going to gas the center it was accurate and it was uh, supported by the plan that had been approved by Washington, D.C. For some reason that morning, though, as we all saw, we began a process of dis dismantling that building. You'll see portions of that on the video in just a, just a minute. The deviation from that plan, had the plan been followed, perhaps many of the people would have walked out under the pressure uh, of the tear gas, or after 48 hours thinking this is futile, I think I'll leave. For any reason, they could have walked out. However, the actions of the FBI in that morning in dismantling that building, which resulted intentionally or accidentally in a fire that killed 86 people, is inexcusable. We do know now, as well, that the FBI had called Parkland Hospital in Dallas to determine how many burn beds were available. That is in a sworn statement filed with a claim for the FBI to pay the medical bills that they incurred when they brought the branch to the to Parkland. There must have been predetermination of a need for burn beds, or premeditation, I think it's called, when it's associated with murder. The actions of the FBI on that day resulted in the murder of 86 people. Take a watch the video now, and then I'll talk more about how the murders occurred that day. Can you turn that on now? Now, we'll continue to run this video. If you can't see very well now, we'll keep it running, and you can walk over later and, and see. Months ago, we didn't have the footage. In fact, I just received it when I was in Waco about a week and a half ago, as I was leaving Waco. It was delivered to me by Ken Foster. We had uh, looked at the footage that was available prior to that, and the only footage we have from the view that Linda Thompson had was the Linda Thompson video. We did have footage, uh, the second one you saw from another camera on Old Mahia Road. The best we could do, though, in looking, in looking at Linda's, was try and discern whether it met the characteristics of a flame floor. The characteristics would be black, high carbon smoke coming up from the flame floor, the tip of the flame floor curling up, as they do on a flame floor, and dripping flame because a flame floor is a gel substance. There also would have been a resultant fire, and we knew that the portion where this entry was made was one of the last portions of the building to burn. The outpost of freedom is concerned with truth. My purpose in traveling around the country and, and going to Waco is to try and, and find what the truth is and report it, knowing that the media, CBS, NBC, CNN, and ABC will not report the truth. So I had taken the position quite some time ago that this was not a flame floor. It was an uncomfortable position to take for the last seven months. But I think that if we're going to win this battle, we have to win with truth. We can't resort to the deceit and fraud that's used by government to convince us that what we see is not what it really is, but what they want us to believe. We have this footage now, and we know that a lot of people around the country have relied on one of the best-selling private videos in history, probably, called Bake Waco the Big Lie. There are some other points in the wake of the big lie that I want to bring to your attention. There's an allegation that there's a fire in the underground bunker. The underground bunker is actually a storm shelter. The FBI told us they found out about the bunker long after the, raid, the initial raid. But in fact, we know from the Davidians that that bunker had been exposed for quite some time. 
They were trying to design a roof that would carry more loads. The roof on the portion that's still covered is wooden frame and plywood, and it kept collapsing whenever they put a load on it, so they were still trying to design a roof that would hold up to it. In the evidence report, we find that there were two cases of CS hand grenades, the canister grenades, the cans like smoke grenades. Of those two cases, nearly half of the grenades were used. We have no reports of any of them being thrown inside the building. It appears that a very heavy concentration of CS gas was put in that underground bunker that led to the building via the bus that we've heard about. A concentration so heavy that it may have been lethal almost immediately. We were told by the Bob Ricks that morning that the children could seek refuge in the underground bunker. That was impossible. The bunker was partially filled with water and gas to a high concentration. There was no refuge for the children in the underground bunker. We heard reports that bodies were recovered in the underground bunker. In fact, only four bodies were. Those bodies were buried on February 28th by the Davidians. The other two that died that day, Michael Schroeder, was picked up by the ATF. And the other death that day was of Peter Gent on the water tower. His body was brought down on March 7th and buried on March 8th. We were told that his body was grappled down by a helicopter and a body part fell to the ground. In fact, the autopsy report indicates there's only one hole in Peter Gent's body, and that was a single bullet that killed him. The best of have reported to me that they had to climb the water tower on the inside stairwell put his body in a sleeping bag and turn it down on their shoulders and then bury it. The autopsy indicates that the body was still in that sleeping bag when it was recovered. The allegations of a fire in the underground bunker. You've all seen these plastic gloves that you use for cleaning. This is the underground bunker after the fire. There's plastic gloves hanging from the ceiling and there's a light bulb still on, smoked up, unbroken. They were the only two things we found intact on the entire, the entire center when we walked around it uh, in May, late May of that year, or this year. Another shot, John. Another shot of the underground bunker, and you can see there's no indication of fire anywhere. We were told that the agents on the roof, uh, threw, one agent threw a hand grenade in and then fired after the others, but as I explained earlier, Scott Snowby did almost all the firing that day. It may have been that he, one of his bullets hit a hand grenade that one of the agents was wearing, a uh, flashbang grenade, and that grenade went off because two of the agents had a lot of abrasive wounds and small fragments uh, on their bodies when the bodies were autopsy. This is a picture taken by the FBI in aerial photographs shortly after the siege began. If you look very closely, behind the parked cars across the driveway, you'll see four objects lying on the ground. Those were the normal dogs they kept around there. They were shot by the FBI and laid out in plain view of the front of the building as an example to the Davidians inside, I suppose. After the fire, you have probably all seen this picture before, the, the water tower still stands. The small building by the water tower stands, and what the ATF and FBI described as the concrete bunker still stands. The concrete bunker was there long before the Davidians built this building. It was used to keep food cool. They called it the lock-in cooler. You'll see three flag spots flying. At the topmost is the United States flag, Next comes the state of Texas flag, and third comes the ATF flag. But you didn't even know they had their own flag. But remember, they were a foreign invading army, so they must bring the flag with them. We'll get into the discussion of snipers after we take a break, but right now I want to get these pictures going around. 
shortly after that, the FBI completely demolished the scene. The water tower was knocked over. In this picture, you'll see it back in the center. It had been cut up now to pay the recovery and storage costs of the vehicles that had been stored up in a town called West Texas, just north of El uh, Elmont, Texas, just north of Waco. The object in the foreground is one of at least seven cipher bunkers built around the center during the siege. If you look closely, you'll see there was plywood on the ground. They have three firing ports, and they had additional firing standbikes for support, so they had a very comfortable sniper nest for prone firing at anybody who exposed themselves. The division could see these from the windows of the center. The FBI at one point reported the division for holding children out to protect them. They weren't. The children were curious and wanted to see the tanks running around the property. But they were aware of the snipers and the constant danger and were very cautious around the windows. The concert unit had encircled the property to keep anybody from escaping after uh, Alan East and uh, Jesse Amen were able to get into the center. Uh, behind that is the Silver Street Express, the bus that you've seen the pictures of. The total demolition of the building by the bulldozers of the FBI or contracted to the FBI left very little on the scene. In the center of this picture, you'll see a square hole, which was one of the underground accesses. It has a pipe sticking out of it. And to the left, you'll see a 55-gallon drum. It was the only heat in the Mount Carmel Center after the electricity was cut off. Again, the 55-gallon drum heater. And behind it, some of the rubble that was once dead walk in for the branch of Indians kept their food in. From these pictures you get a clear picture of what the ATF did to the site. They destroyed any traces of evidence that might have existed after they left the site. They vandalized the vehicles, the private property of those people. As near as we can tell, the damage estimate, the damage to the branch of Indian property exceeded three and a half million dollars in loss of personal property in the building. In the building was a chapel. It was destroyed. There was also another chapel near the entrance to the property. Three walls were still standing from a chapel that dated back from the 1930s. That chapel was torn to the ground as well by the government. Okay, now we'll take a break for a little while. You can go up and look at the video if you're not sure of what you saw. Now, if you remember from the Voice over on the video. The FBI had complete control of the three areas where the fire started on that fateful day. It doesn't say that the FBI started the fire. It doesn't say the Grand Civilian did. We don't know. We don't have any solid evidence. But what I discussed after the break, I think, will make you begin to understand what the intentions of the government were that day. So let's take about 15 minutes. You can look at the videos. Uh, these pictures will still be going around, and there's some of the information in the videos. Are the a lot of question arises over what happened on April 19, 1993. You've seen the video, and that's all centered around prior to the fire. It seems clear that since the FBI and LICO had submitted a plan to Washington for approval that allowed the 48 hours of gassing and indicated that no dismantling of the building would occur until after the 48 hour period, that there was some deception applied by the ATF, Jeff Jamar and company in LICO. The day of the fire, I remember looking at the southwest corner where the damage was done to the right of the front door. Smoke came out for a few minutes out of the second floor window. And then all of a sudden, flame burst from that window. That was the first fire we saw on the television that day. Immediately, a tank backed away from that corner. It's only speculation to say that it's very possible that through the hole that you see being made right now, that a tank operator or somebody in the tank could have thrown an incendiary or a thermite grenade into that building, or perhaps a few of them, to ignite the building. As I say, that's only speculation. But the damage done to the front door on that wall 
resulted in a fire or provided access. And as the video pointed out, those areas were under control of the FBI. As word came out what happened to the people inside, one of the first things we heard was a large number of people were shot to death in the forehead. As the reports began to solidify, we found that a lot of the injuries were caused by high-powered rifle bullets. A pistol bullet will usually lodge in the skull, it will not exit, it's a lower velocity bullet. A rifle bullet, if you remember the pictures of John Kennedy in the crude film, causes an explosion, a compression of the uh, liquid matter of the brain, and then uh, upon exit, the compression is released and is actually burst. So it's a horrible sight to observe. Most of the people were shot with high-powered rifle bullets, but the evidence log indicates that over 86 pistols were found inside the center. David Koresh received a, a high-powered rifle wound to the left side of his forehead. David had had his left hand injured on February 28th. David then must have taken his right hand to fire the rifle and shoot himself in the head. After the FBI gave us that story, I think they realized that that was very impossible. So then they told us that Steve Snyder had shot David Koresh. James Riddle was found five feet from David Koresh. David Koresh was identified by dental records. James Riddle was identified by fingerprints. It seems kind of strange that five feet distance can cause that much difference in the damage or destruction of the body. We don't have the autopsy reports on any but those killed the first day at this time, so we can't look at the autopsy to see what damage occurred to the bodies and how what disparities exist. What we do know is about three months ago, Jamie Castillo, who came out of the fire, was talking to Rita Riddle, who was staying at the Brittany Hotel in Waco, on the phone and said, how's James? Rita said, James died in the fire. Jamie said, no, I saw him outside. James Riddle got outside that day. Somehow his body was found inside with a high-power rifle bullet to the forehead. That obviously created concern on, on the part of a number of us that continue to return to Waco and try and investigate, uh, find whatever we can of what occurred during the entire 51-day siege. That was all we had about what might have happened on April 19th until just about a week and a half ago when I had an opportunity, I and a few other people had an opportunity to speak to one of the divisions that came out of the fire that day. He has asked that we not use his name, so you'll have to rely on my word on this. He says that people left the east side of the building in mass. That after some of them have be, begun being shot by rifle bullets, that they chose to return to the fire rather than stand against the rifle fire outside. If you go back to Newsweek and Time magazine, you'll see on the body, body recovery map, the 10 to 15 bodies were found in a little courtyard area where the building makes a U. You can see it in these areas as well. Those bodies were all outside of the debris line meaning they couldn't have fallen from the second floor at that far out, farther than the walls themselves. So we can only speculate what happened, but we do have the word of one division, and that word will become testimony come January when the trials begin. The snipers were actually murdering people as they tried to leave the center that day. It would be a guess to assume that uh, the FBI would have known that they would have go out the east side of the building. We knew the west side was covered both from Satellite City and Old Mejia Road, and to attempt to assassinate people on the west side would be impractical, unless we look at what happened to the west side of the building. You've just seen footage of the damage that was created on that side. The only people that escaped from that side had to escape from the second floor. We can only put the pieces together in a speculative manner at this point. Hopefully in January or February this year, some more truths will come out about what occurred on April 19th at Mount Carmel, Waco, Texas. My firm belief is that your government chose to assassinate witnesses to a crime, burn the evidence to the ground, 
and then came in with bulldozers and destroyed any evidence that remained. It was over three weeks before we could go on the property. The sheriff was starting it very closely. The pictures that you've looked at, the vehicles were taken by one of the Davidians, Janice Kendrick. Uh, while the front cars were still on site. They were removed from the site shortly after that, and it was late in May when we were allowed on the property. Well, we weren't allowed. We went on the property with permission of the divisions and took the remaining pictures of the destruction that was left by the FBI. Dick DeGrom will be testifying. He's not defending any of the divisions. He will be testifying in trial. If he were to defend any of the divisions, he would not be able to testify. For a bar attorney, I think he's a very courageous man, and he's passing an opportunity to, of a lifetime to defend the Davidians, and he's chosen instead to help bring a little bit of the truth to the courtroom, which uh, will be in San Antonio. The outpost of freedom is something that came from Waco. It was a newspaper, now it's a fax network. Its objective is to seek the truth and report it to you. A lot of controversy has arisen out of Waco. I've tried to not speculate on what happened unless there's an overwhelming amount of evidence, as I just indicated, about the possibility of assassinations on April 19th. We've heard a lot of reports and rumors. Rumors came out early on, more code messages. Uh, HDDT and MUC, seven children died. Second raid, 10 ATF agents died. That was one of the reports that came out. Most of the rumors emanated from one single source. He's a good friend of mine, but he feels that anything to get interest is enough uh, can justify the, uh, the rumors that he was spreading. His name is Ken Foster. I, on the other hand, as I said before, believe that only the truth, uh, with, only with the truth can we win the task that we have ahead of us, which is restoration of constitutional government. I've given up my business and I travel around the country and I rely on contributions from people like yourself and from the sale of information that hopefully will help you understand better what occurred in different uh, situations around the country. We're going to pass a couple of cans around and I hope that you'll be very generous because as I say, this is my only income now and I want to keep pursuing this. Towards the end of the events at Mount Carmel on radio programs around the country, uh, I began talking about a church in Montana. Elizabeth Per Prophet had a church called Church Universal and Triumphant. We had begun to see the smear campaigns going on about her church, indicating that it was a cult. We anticipated that the ACF would, as soon as possible, be traveling to Montana. I was prepared to go to Montana in the event something occurred up there. My feeling at the time, and the Davidians agree with me, is what happened in Waco is a shot heard around this country, if not around the world. And we have to take notice from what occurred in Waco that the government does have a final solution for those that would oppose it and attempt to restore constitutional government. What we have begun talking about as far as Montana would be that if the people in Montana needed the aid, uh, if we had to go to the aid of our neighbors in Montana, that we should go. And if that aid was against force of arms, that we might be required to use force of arms in that defense. I hope that we've all started thinking that way. This country was founded on neighbor helping neighbor, whether it was against Indian attacks or outlaw attacks whether it was fire, where the volunteer fire department would, would risk their life to save property, or the original posses that would pursue the bad guys and arrest them. Those were lay people. The original posses weren't sheriffs or policemen hired for the position. Instead, they were the uh, able-bodied males from 14 to 45 years of, of age. This country's strength came from helping our neighbors. It's a gift from God, the feeling that you get when you help your neighbors. And we need to think again of helping our neighbors and not relying on the administrative agencies that now rule this country. There are a lot of solutions to what the government is doing, but we need to find one and focus on it. And I'm sure all of you, by being here, are looking for those solutions, and I encourage you to continue pursuing them. Remember a few things. In the beginning of this country, on April 19th, 
1775, 86 men and boys left the church in Lexington, Massachusetts to stand against the greatest army the world had ever known. They didn't go to protect their property or their own lives. They went to protect their thought, and their thought was freedom and liberty. They went to buy time for those down the road in Concord who had to hide the weapons that they had been hiding in Concord from the British. In Concord, other churches sent their militias to uh, Concord to secure those weapons and remove them from the British. They, too, ended up battling the British that day. Two months later, George Washington took militias from around the area, took them to Boston to break the siege that had been going on around Boston, trying to deny them goods because they had had a tea party there just a while before. It wasn't until 14 months later that some people met and signed a document called the Declaration of Independence. I'm going to read just a bit from that document. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evil, evils are sufferable than to right them, uh, themselves by abolishing the forms of which they are accustomed. But when long trains of abuses and usurpations Pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to re reduce them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide such, uh, for new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient suffrage of these colonies, and such now is the necessity which constrains them to alter their former system of government. The authority to make the changes that are necessary to keep this country alive and viable and a nation under God were given to us a long time ago in two simple pieces of paper. One was the Declaration, the other was the Constitution. We know that the strongest government is the county, the second the state, and finally the federal government. We know also that that's been turned over, that we've been denied the local rule that was the, the concept that this country was established on, and instead we've become a nation that's subject to or slaves of Washington, D.C. I understand a lot of you are working for county control down here. I looked into Captain County when I was writing my newspaper and was very impressed by what they done, had done, and I encourage all of you to pursue those ends. But at the same time, don't forget, it might come that the time for us to, again, wrest control of government from government comes without the means of the peaceful solution, but only by avoiding the final solution that we saw in Waco. I'd like to answer any questions you have about the outpost of freedom or about what occurred in Waco, Connecticut, or New York, the places that I've gone to cover stories. I think it's going to take them a minute just now to set things up, so uh, to just be patient. Any questions now? Hang on. So, what you like about Hang on. Let me, let me get this on. Let me get this on. We'll just go ahead and use your, we'll just bring the microphone over. I'd like to know what you were talking about in Montana and where that is, please. Just outside of Bozeman, Montana, is a 34,000-acre property that's owned by the Church Universal and Triumphant. Elizabeth Claire Prophet is the pastor and the leader of that church. The membership of the church, from what I understand, is almost 30,000, of which about 28,000 live in the Bozeman area. About half of those apparently live on the church property. Towards the end of Waco, in uh, the middle of April, we began seeing on television these news magazine stories about this church in Montana. But they were referring to the church as a cult, and they were indicating that tanks had been seen on the property, that many of the members were armed, that they had created pill boxes and underground bunkers and fortifications on the property. I had uh, received a number of phone calls while I was with me in Waco from all over the country, actually hundreds of phone calls, people supporting what I was doing, 
and uh, a few of them were from Montana, so I stayed in touch with them to try and find out what was happening. Initially, the uh, reports indicated a lot of tension on the ch uh, church's part. Uh, the church denied that they were assaulted. They kept making denials, but a lot of the people felt the clear prophet, the church members felt the clear prophet wasn't uh, getting prepared for the inevitable that might, they felt would occur there, so they left the church. Later on, Claire Prophet ordered all the people in the church to sell their rifles and shoot so a lot of the weapons that the church owned itself. That again caused a number of people to leave the church. So the threat of anything occurring in Montana right now, at least on that church property, is probably non-existent. But it had all the earmarks that uh, preceded what had happened in Waco, the press coverage, uh, the smear campaign prior to. Remember, Waco couldn't have happened if they didn't make it a cult rather than a sect. A small, I spoke at a church just down the road here. Uh, you might call it a sect. It had, uh, has a congregation of 20 or 30 people, smaller than Mount Carmel. But it is as susceptible to government intrusion as any other church. Uh, we're looking at people all over the facts network feed information back up as well. And so we're looking for anything that might occur along those lines. And through the fax network, we get the information back out. In fact, if any of you have a fax machine and would like to get on the network, if after we're done talking, you get with me. Uh, if you have a dedicated fax machine, we can make sure that you receive the releases that we send out whenever something has happened. Any more questions? Uh, let's go and start here. I'd like to know why so many people, what made them follow him in the first place? Yeah, I guess the best answer to that is we have a tape up here. It's a message that James Craig sent out on tape on March 2nd, 1993. Rita Riddle, who was somebody I got to know quite well that was a member of the church, she came out of the church on March 21st. She lives in South Carolina, and her brother James, the one that died, probably outside and was thrown back inside on the 19th, had brought David out to South Carolina to visit his family. Uh, Ruth's mother had been, been to Waco a few times or to California where they have another church and was very pleased with the way David presented the scriptures. Rita was a church girl that had no interest in getting involved in education or in, in, in a religion to the degree that, uh, that was offered with the branch of the church. However, when David came to South Carolina and spoke to her, she had never heard anybody that had mastered the scriptures as well as David Koresh. She ended up two months later moving to Waco, Texas. She felt that he had answers that the churches she'd been going to could not provide an interpretation of the scriptures. I think that's why we all choose the church that we attend. We feel that that church provides a better answer of what God's word is than the church that we might have left. And that is what brought people to the Branch Davidian Church. Now, one difference, though, is the Branch Davidian Church is a sect of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has been speaking of the eleventh hour for quite some time. So, their doctrine is a little bit different than most Christian churches, but there, it's not a cult, and it's nothing unusual. There are churches like that all over this country that have been since the beginning of this country. It's not what the FBI told you. It's just normal people choosing to live together in a religious manner. Okay, let's go over here to this lady. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Okay, hang on here. Got to get our camera around here. Why is the government making an example of the Waco people, Randy Weaver, Sarah Crawford? What is the reasoning behind what they're doing? Why are they doing it? Why are they... They've proven that all their allegations were false, you know, like they didn't... Uh, abuse the children and uh, whatever it was with the guns, they, they were legal. So what's the reason for behind all of this? Well, one of the things we're we'll doing with Waco first, one of the things we know about the Mount Carmel Center is that it was attacked about 11 days before the budget hearings began on the ATF. The ATF has been going around the country busting down doors in six, eight, ten, and twelve man teams for years. But any firearm you buy in this country is legal if you buy it from a dealer. 
The search warrant indicates that everything they purchased was legal. The ATF, however, had been building towards this larger force, a hundred man force, to go out and do jobs. Like anybody in government, they wanted to build an empire. They had to draw agents from New Orleans and Houston offices to conduct the raid in Waco. After that first day, I called the ATF in Florida. They had just sent 10 men down to Waco to help back up the forces that had gotten trounced when they kicked the wrong door. But the hearings were coming up, and we believed that there was, a, there, there was concern that the ATF might not exist after the budget hearings. But instead, to, to give a good offense, they decided to show that they needed a 100-man force to go into larger areas where larger amounts of guns existed. They knew that automatic weapons existed in Los Angeles, but that was too dangerous. So they thought that a church would be a good show. We know that they advised the press that they were coming in. <laughs> Going a little further back, two things were attacked in Waco that are significant for all of us, the First and Second Amendments to the Constitution. It seems the government is trying to tell them, just send us a message, and that message is don't resist us, don't speak against us. So the prophet was speaking a religion, uh, Randy Weaver was practicing a religion, and the branch of it is for practicing a religion that celebrates the Sabbath on Saturday. They don't use the word Jesus, they use the word Yeshua. There are some other differences. They won't eat, uh, don't eat pork. So they're living by some old traditional values that uh, certain Christian or Judaic religions practice. So they're being isolated probably because it is easy to disenfranchise them from the mainstream Christians in the country today. We can only speculate at the bottom motivation, but the pattern seems to be that government oppression is a reality and it's growing every year. Anyone else have a question? Okay, we're going to go over here before we do let's get uh, our cameraman on target here. I'm, I'm just curious. I know it would only be speculation on your part, but I don't understand why ABC, NBC, CBS, and CNN, I don't, you were there with these men uh, for who knows how many days. You must have had a chance to talk to them. Where are they? You know, I, I mean, I just don't understand. I, I, I can't understand the government trying to cover up their tracks for doing the dastardly deeds that they did, but I can't understand where there's got to be a reporter somewhere. You know, it just, stuff like this doesn't, it, it follows my mind to think about all of them reporters out there for all of them days, camping out, everything else, with all of their heavy duty equipment and everything, and I don't hear nobody saying nothing. Well, uh, I had an opportunity to have dinner one night with a reporter and a producer from CBS. Uh, while we were eating, I asked uh, Larry if uh, they are not reporting the truth. Larry said, Jerry, I have three children and a wife. And then he went on to explain what happens with the establishment media. The people that own the media, most of the media, in fact, it's the Belo family in Texas, but in CBS, it was other whoever owns CBS. They're the same people that make substantial contributions to campaigns during the election. You could say they own the press and the government. They impose a degree of censorship, what they believe should or should not be broadcast. The station manager then, not wanting to lose his job, will impose a buffer on that to make sure he's never challenged by what he allows out. Then we get down to the producer. The producer knows what the manager wants, and he'll add a buffer on to what he allows out to make sure that his job is never threatened. Then we get down to the reporter, and Larry told me about a young reporter who had come on and done some really great stories, well verified, well documented. The guy did three of those stories, and he was fired, and none of the stories were ever aired. So the press is controlled by the ownership of the press. When you get to a small radio station, you're more likely to get truth than when you get to a larger radio station. Unfortunately, it's true, but during the press conferences, many answers came out. For example, one thing you never heard, probably, was a question that was asked once, what happened to the $1,000 that David sent out to buy the milk? Rick's answer was, $4,000. I don't know. Let me look into it, and I'll report back tomorrow. The next morning, in the monologue that he gives at the beginning of each press conference, 
He said, well, the $1,000 was used, to, uh, was turned over to the U.S. attorney. We bought the milk for the children. Well, David had sent the money out because he didn't want anything from the government. But the FBI wanted to tell the public, which they had three weeks prior, when they bought the milk, that we are giving them milk. We are giving them ice cream. We are giving them videos. We are giving them batteries. Never did $1,000 worth of equipment go in that David paid for, but the press or the government in their spin wanted to tell the press that we're giving these gifts to David Koresh and the people inside, the children especially. Well, I didn't see the answer any of the, I had to tell this lady, this reporter, about the thousand dollars. They didn't ask the videos that come out what had occurred there. They went to the press conferences, then they went down to the Hilton and had a drink with lunch, and then they went and socialized all evening long, went to bed, got up, and went to the press conference. Their only source of news throughout most of Waco was the press conference. They didn't go out to find out anything because they already had the biggest story in the country in their backyard. So they chose, for whatever reason, not to report what was occurring in Waco. There are a number of other incidents. I don't want to get into all the little ones now, but little stories like that thousand dollars. The fact that seven bugs went in, attached to the video boxes, the freezer to cooler containers, the milk came in. Uh, this is kind of a few stories, so I'll tell it. Now the Davidians found out all these bugs were in there. They found seven bugs. And so they sent them up to David's room, and David gave Bible studies to seven ATF agents who were trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> the next day in the press conference, the Bob Ricks said, they have cut off negotiations with us. There was no change in the negotiations. What had happened is the FBI didn't have their spy bugs in there gathering information anymore. There was no change in the phone conversations, but the FBI had to make David look bad for finding the bugging devices and playing a little trick on them. Any questions, David? Okay. No camera. Let me get over here. This, he does not want to be on camera. Gotcha. Uh, my question is, uh, why can't it bring the Davidians? Why did they leave? Okay, that's a lot of people asking. And um, second question, do you think sometimes response is like, like with the branch civilians or even some other cases, would it be a lot better to take your chances in court rather than barricading yourself in a house or something like that with weapons? Even though in some cases we'll say that you know, of course they're controlled or whatever. So are you married? If you were married and had children and were sitting home and watching television one evening or Sunday morning you were preparing breakfast, and all of a sudden, people outside the started shooting at your house. You ran to the closet, got your shot and gun, and fired back, and then they took cover. And then they yelled to you, you're under arrest. Whether it was valid or not, them being there, you've all of a sudden defied them. And if your shotgun blast and killed one of them, and you heard over the radio that that guy had been killed, you wouldn't want to go out. Now you start thinking of your wife and children. Do you want to send them out? Well, the first thing the government said is, send out your children. It could have been a mistake. They might have had the wrong address. That happens all across the country. But what they said is, send out your children. How many mothers in here would send your children out to the government if you somehow got involved in a situation similar to Waco or similar to what I just described, a reaction to a mistake by government? I don't know if I'd give up my children, but the Davidians wanted to test that. They sent their children out, some of the children. They sent some of the adults out. Sheila Martin came out, and she brought three of her children with her. She had seven children. The people were told when they left, you don't own anything. The government has seized all the property out there. When they put them in jail, put them in nice orange uniforms, put chains on their ankles and wrists, and traded them in front of cameras, the children were taken away and put in foster homes. The world went back to the people inside. This is what's going to happen to you. Let's just assume that there was no guilt. If they weren't charged with defending themselves and killing seven eight, or four ATF agents that first day, but just there was gunfire, a few injuries, and that was it. Still, knowing that they fought back, they knew that they were going to go to court. They would be held in jail until they did. That could be a year or more, considering the complexity and the number of defendants. 
The children would be taken away and put in foster homes, and all the property taken by the government. If they went to court and prevailed, and were acquitted or found not guilty, when they walked out of that courtroom, they would have owned nothing. Their children would be gone. If they could get their children back, they would have to rebuild a relationship after a year. Their reputations had been ruined, and they were starting over in life. You think about that. That's what the people inside thought about when they decided after the 21st of March not to come out. Their lives had been destroyed. Whether it was intentional or a mistake, their lives had been destroyed. They would lost their children, their property, their life savings, everything they've worked for. I can't see myself walking out of there if I were in there. I don't know if you could or not. Okay, let's go over here to this lady. Um, I have a question. Um, I was listening to the media, of course, he, um, saying how many weapons they had in there. Um, they had a huge amount of weapons, huge amount of ammunition. Um, if they had all that, why was there really no major explosion? The explosion, the explosion that they had was no worse than what you've seen out in California with the regular fires that were going on. Well, the, the large explosion you saw was so fantastic. It uh, blew up. There were some other minor explosions. We don't know exactly what caused them. But we do know that a thousand rounds of, of ammunition at least were found inside. A lot of guns were found inside. The ammunition was still in crates. Some of it remained unburned. The, uh, if there was a drug bust and they found automatic weapons, the first thing you'd see was the weapons, automatic weapons plated, put on a white sheet to make sure you could see very clearly these weapons. If there was a bank robbery and automatic weapons were used, you'd see these traded across the television screen. Here we heard about a 50 caliber machine gun in an ambush. And if anyone got the right paper, if you look on March 17th, you'll see how we dealt with that issue. And we never heard them mention it again. But we, what we've not seen is the machine gun, is the automatic weapons traded across the television. What we do have is an evidence list of uh, 384 pages with 10 items per page. So large amounts of ammunition and large amounts of rifles were found there. We have nothing to indicate that any of those rifles had been converted to a full automatic weapon. We also have sound coverage in both the 911 and the video footage of the first day. We cannot find any automatic gunfire except two and three round bursts that would be consistent with the MP5s and the M16s that were used by the ATF. They have a selective two and three round burst. We don't hear any automatic gunfire. So I don't believe that there are any automatic weapons inside or there were found inside. We do know there was a Brett Light 50, which is a semi-automatic 50 caliber rifle. It is legal. In fact, the day I left Waco for the second time on July 3rd, uh, there was a gun show in the same location where the press conferences were held. There was a 50 caliber light dress for sale there for $1,550. I could have bought it. So that gun was not illegal, nor was it used at all during the entire stage. So I don't believe there were any automatic weapons. I think we're being told the story, hoping that the steam will die down by the time this goes to trial as it does. Okay, we're going to come back here to this gentleman. Yes, are you aware of the presence of the use of the NDTS in that area? No, no, not really. What I'm aware of is the FBI did have some uniformed people it's called the Hostage Rescue Team. In fact, they were quartered in the New Road Inn, which is where I stayed during the entire siege for the last four days, from April 15th to April 19th. They had a Hertz Kinski rental truck that had a number of large gun cases that we presented to be sniper rifles. They had a lot of electronic equipment in the truck as well. We saw it on a few occasions. Unfortunately, I didn't get any pictures. We know that the ATF was there in force. The additional forces were sent out after the initial raid from all over the country. Five and ten man teams from many of the offices that could spare them. We know that the uh, Department of Public Services, Texas Department of Public Services, provided a large amount of people for security on the perimeter. And in all that we could observe, we never saw anything but those uniforms indicated 
Uh, we didn't find any evidence of any foreign or non-English speaking foods. That's not to say they didn't exist. If you understand that that six miles by two miles by two miles by uh, four mile perimeter around that, there's no showing what occurred in there. Frequently, goose and a half trucks with canvas uh, sides and canvas backs entered the property and left or the area and left the area. We had no access to that. The area of TSPI, the airfield in Texas State Technical Institute, uh, where the headquarters of the ATF were, where the service of that one agent was uh, conducted, were secured and guarded with that explosive truck that you saw in the picture and well protected perimeter. So what went from TSPI to the perimeter and the encampment that was out of camera range, we don't know. But I saw no indications of multi jurisdictional transport. Anybody else have a question back here? Not on camera, though. Um, I have a number of things that come to mind. The, if you were to replay in which the good guys won, the Davidians won, what options did they have tactically to preserve their safety if they knew what was going to happen in the end? Was there anything they could do or was, or was there nothing they could do? That's my first question. Well, let's take one at a time then. I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean. If they won well, the initial... If, if you and I are in the Dominion compound, and we're facing on day one, two, three, or four, what we were facing at that time in our assumption, as you outlined a minute ago, would there have been any advantage to uh, taking weapons with which we had, with no ammunition in them, and prayed outside around so, so the long-range cameras would see that they would have to shoot us in front of the cameras to protect our lives. You mean a peaceful force of uh, outside going out to the city. our own compound. Uh, would that have been, have been tactically possible? And would there be any advantage that, or was there nothing that they could do? They were going to die no matter what from day one or from day negative one. Well, according to Bob Rick, who was self-fulfilling prophecy, the FBI just assisted David in accomplishing to our belief, we could have found a solution if we could have gotten enough people to come to Waco. The greatest number of patriots to come on any one day was April 3rd, and there were about 120 to 130 people that came to Waco. Any other day, no, there weren't. As far as what could have been done, it is very possible that a large force of unarmed people, without weapons, I wouldn't want to give them. An unloaded weapon is a dangerous thing. Uh, I would not want to walk out with an unloaded rifle and present myself and give them an excuse to shoot me. But what we had planned on uh, March 7th was for hundreds of people to go camp out unarmed, just intervene, stand between the two, a peaceful force saying, no, we are the government of America and you will not cross this line to kill these people. I think that would have worked. I'm not sure. Some people say if something happened in Montana, they would prefer a peaceful force to force to go to Montana. But when I sat in the motel room watching that fire, I walked outside and watched the smoke rising in the sky. Something went through me that said there is no peaceful solution anymore. I've been pursuing a peaceful solution for six years. And to me, the peaceful solution disappeared at that time. Okay. That's, that's an acceptable answer, right? Um, the other, the other thing that, that might be pertinent to our discussion that goes undefined in, in the conversation, um, the American people, as we listen to what the media presented, are, are not aware that about 85, 87 percent of the media don't attend church anywhere on a, on a, nation, on a national basis. Uh, in fact, there's a distinct bias in their questioning of those who do attend church that they haven't been covering a church event even a positive one. So they're not in the crowd that's going to give the uh, uh, view of a church that is accurate because they don't know anything about it. Is, is that a correct statement? You're being a media person. I would say that the people that I met in Waco, uh, very few attended church, but some did. On uh, Sunday mornings, for example, uh, there were a few members that would take off the entire morning to attend services locally. But I would say I knew of perhaps two that did that out of probably 40 that I was aware of. So I would say that the representation of church scores in the media, in Waco at least, was very small. It's not, it's not too different than, 
than the way that uh, the people who watch Noah build his ark behave in terms of in relationship to Noah. No, it's not. Um, I'll tell you a little story about me, though. In 1967, I left God when I was in Vietnam. I couldn't believe that God could allow what was happening over there to happen on this earth. Uh, sometime last year, God came back and said, hey, you're missing something. And since then, I feel that uh, uh, the only way I could accomplish what I've been doing is with assistance from somebody far superior to what I am. The question that you've just answered then is, is leads into a premise, and that would be to define church, which probably isn't within the area of your uh, expertise necessarily. You did give a, a semblance of an answer, and we all subscribe to that one. That is, wherever you learn about God the best. Um, what I'm concerned about in, the, in where I'm getting at is the sovereignty of God in the matter having to do with the Davidians or any other future group that behaves like the Davidians from the government's point of view. Um, and uh, I have a, a one-page paper uh, that I have written. It's by uh, Reverend uh, Kenneth Gary Dalvin, Talbot, rather. It's called The Transformation of the Church from Reality to Fiction. Um, he is uh, with the uh, family road through the School of Common Law and the Whitefield Theological Seminary. He has uh, upper level degrees beyond being just a theologian, both in law and common law, as some of you are familiar with, us, and otherwise. And what he says in his paper is that there, that there is no such thing as a church which has incorporation papers. Five one two three. Yes, and and that the government knows it, and the church doesn't. That without regard to denomination. Um, I live in Lake County, and I inquired. That's the largest uh, population in the state. If there was a, any church in Lake County that did not have incorporation papers, and there's not one. So what I'm about is to establish one based on what this says. Now, not because I'm a pastor or a theologian, but because I know that I cannot receive God's protection unless I'm actually in a church that God has defined. And if any of you want a copy of this or find what I'm saying, interesting and relevant to what you've been saying. Um, I mean, what we need God's protection. Definitely. We cannot receive it unless we're obeying what he laid out to be the church. And um, uh, there are many interpretations, but we're not getting the protection that we need. The people in 1776, 79 of them faced 1,500, and by the end of the day had won the field for a number of reasons. Principally, I would suggest because God was, they were in fact on God's side. People worry about it. Moral courage. Well, it's more than that. It, it, they didn't have the, the power. It wasn't by force of arms that they did it. It was because they had the moment. They had God's sovereign attention. Now, that's what we need as a group here, um, and we do not have it yet. We have a real concern. We have government out of control, but we can't redress it until we have what they had, and it must come about in a way that we haven't tried yet. We, we all know that this country was a gift from God. It was given to us over 200 years ago. Uh, we failed the country, and only with God's help, and as I pointed out, with truth can we redeem this gift from God that's called the United States of America. So I agree with you completely. I'll tell you another interesting little story about Waco. After a number of people had come out, they were either in jail or were in the Salvation Army halfway house. The Salvation Army is under contract to the Federal Bureau of Prisons, so I will never drop a dime in a red bucket again. But they had lost some. The Salvation Army in Waco is under contract to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And I will never drop a dime in a red bucket again. Pardon? Dropping a dime in a red bucket? Federal Bureau of Prisons? It's an administrative agency of the federal government that contracts uh, certain different people for halfway houses and now for prisons. Federal prisons are becoming private contract operations now. So they are under contract in Waco to the Federal Bureau of Prisons, which is why they were detaining 
Rita Riddle, Sheila Martin, Daddy Zotman, Ruth uh, Riddle until she was put back in jail, uh, Catherine Madison, all these ladies that came out and some of the men that came out. They go under the guise of Christian They go under that guise, yes, but they're under contract with the federal government. I don't know, but that was enough. When I learned that in high school, I chose never to drop a dime in a bucket again. But when I talked to Rita one day and I asked him if they needed anything, the needs are simple. They had clothes. Uh, they had been given back some of their clothes that they carried out with them. The clothes that they left with were kept, including panties and bras, by the uh, ATF and FBI for whatever reason. So the only need that they had was the Bibles. Their Bibles had notes in them, so the Bibles were taken as evidence. So we, uh, out of the contributions that have come from across the country to the yeah, outpost of freedom out there, uh, we acquired some Bibles. But when I talked to Rita on the phone, I said, what version of the Bible do you want? And she said, well, King James. And I had begun reading the Geneva Bible, and it's interesting that you, meant, you mentioned the church. Uh, one of the orders that King James gave when the King James Version was uh, interpreted was, uh, whenever the term congregation appears, change that to church. Why did King James do that? Because the church was the authority in England, and this created an obligation to the church for obedience to God, which allowed King James to rule through the church and control the people, not just by political force, but by religious or theological force. Uh, for those who haven't seen the King James or the Geneva Bible, it's a rather interesting Bible. It reads a little bit differently. The changes are very subtle. But you might be surprised at what King James, who is described as a pervert, created when he had the Bible reinterpreted in accordance with his rules. But just as this is a nation under God, and we have an obligation to God if we believe in God to redeem this country, this gift that he gave us, and that's why I'm here tonight, and I think that's why you're here tonight as well. Okay, we got time for about two more questions here, Ron Gary. Uh, Gary. Uh, would you please uh, comment on uh, the interrelationship of all these things like the Weaver incident, the, the Waco uh, disaster, and all and these other potential ones uh, as they relate to the programs of the New World Order? Um, we don't have two hours, do we? Um, we can look at a lot of it since Donald Scott out in California was killed because they wanted his land for park service. There was never any reason to believe that there was marijuana growing on the property. There was never any found. However, he came out in his underwear with a gun in his hand and was shot dead. Randy Weaver, the Branch Davidians, uh, were set Sabbath uh, worshiping people. They celebrated on the Sabbath on Saturday, so there's a common element that allows them to be changed from main mainstream. We do believe that the National Council of Churches is the entity that will be the National Church, just as the Episcopal Church became the Church of England back in King James rule. The New World Order, according to Global Plan 2000, is supposed to emerge in the year 2000. We are supposed to have a one world government. It's a plan that's been around for a long time. It's been attempted many times, but this method is allegedly a peaceful method done by politics and finance. It appears in that plan that one of the requisite uh, changes is a conversion of the United States to acceptance of one world government by the year 1995. 14 months away. That's one reason I feel that right now we're on a fast track to the accomplishment of those goals. The activities we see were told in the, in the established press. Now, back to the ownership of the established press. They're the ones that buy our politicians. Uh, are to smooth the road, as we saw happen in Waco. The truth is coming out now. You keep hearing them over and over again. A little at a time. But they come out slowly. So the impact of the lies that we were fed during Waco hasn't really hit most people yet. You sit down and listen to changes from what you believe then to what you believe now. If you got all those at one time, you'd probably pick up a rifle and go shoot some government officer. There are so many lies that have stretched over such a long period of time, and more truths will come out in a period of time. 
But I have no doubt that the court is one world government and that we have less than 14 months uh, to begin the process of redemption of this country. I will say that there are some possible solutions and one we thought about in regards to Montana. If our Prophet's Church were attacked, not only would we, uh, some of us go to defend our neighbor, that perhaps the people in Montana would call together a grand jury of the people. The sheriff would not comply that they would call a grand jury on their own behalf. That grand jury, based on the evidence available, could issue presentments or indictments for those agents named and unnamed who were in that county pointing their guns in the wrong direction and firing those guns, perhaps killing people. Higgins, Stevens, well, Stevens is gone now, isn't there? Higgins is gone now, but Reno uh, and Benson. Those people could be indicted by that grand jury. And then that sheriff or those people in that county could call together the mainstay of justice in this country called the Posse Comitata. And the Posse Comitata could go arrest those people and take them to Montana for trial. This is just a thought, something to think about. If something happens, we don't want to just go defend the people in their own home. We need to stretch out and start regaining our country in every corner. But the problem is we've got to react, not act. We can't go to Washington and start shooting people. But when they start shooting at us, we have to wisely, using our heads, God's gift to us, react to what they're doing and then broaden that reaction to begin a process of changing the battleground to our playing field, not theirs. I, I don't know if you were looking for more on that, but I do believe that apparently you do that one world government is, um, is going to be the next uh, government in this country unless we do redeem the gifts that God gave us. And uh, I, I know that you're working on local uh, county. And uh, like I said before, I encourage that perhaps a peaceful solution can be found. Yeah, we have a question back here. Actually, I found out that we can go almost as late as we want to tonight. And that's entirely up to, to Gary and the audience here as well. I'll let you want to carry this on. Because uh, we don't, you know, we know people have to get up in the morning. They've got maybe distances to travel. So I'm going to leave it up to you, Gary, and up to the audience as to And I'll stay as long as you don't have questions because my purpose in coming here is to answer those. And uh, so the audience, if you want to stick around, we'll, we'll just continue the question and answer period. And, and I hear it. Okay, we got a question. Uh, I don't recall the name of the gentleman, but the guy in California that was shot. Did his heirs get his land back? Was the status of his property? Donald Scott, his land was not taken because they found no marijuana on the property. I think yes. Another question? Is there a minute? The second one is, every talks about but what is the agenda? What would, world, what would our life look like? if they get exactly what they want, and what is our basis for believing that? Well, I think if you look around the United States today, you'll see exactly what one world order is. It's a country controlled by government. But the founding fathers didn't have that in mind. That's why they said the best government is the small government, and that's the government that we can touch. That's the county level. Then came the state. To read the preamble of the Constitution, it never binds the people to the document, only the states. It was a union. Should any states be added to this union, they have all the rights of other states. It's not a contract with the people. The democracy in this country is between the states and the federal government. The republic is the one guaranteed by Article 4, Section 4. And that is the 50 countries within the 51st country that are, uh, that are not sovereign are republics. Now, what's the difference between a democracy and a republic? A democracy, the, body, the sovereign life is the body politic. That means the body politic has the right of God and control anything. Anything that the body politic, the majority passes, becomes an imposition on everybody else. But in a republic, the sovereign lies with me and with you. And what is the sovereign? It's the, it's the right that God gave us individually. And that's right, I can't give the government. I can't give, I'm sorry, I can't give them rights that I don't have. I don't have the right to take your money to pay my medical bill. I don't have the right to put you in jail. I don't have many rights that government has assumed. So if we are republics, those rights are denied government. 
We cannot give them the government. So what we would come to in this country is mob rule, what was called mob rule in the early part of this century. We have democracy, and world government will be democracy. And how is democracy controlled? We talked about that. It's not what most of us believe, it's what the people that buy the politicians believe. So in fact, we're deceived in the democracy into believing we've got a say. But in fact, we don't. NASA is probably a good example of that. I was on the news that evening that, oh boy, it's a tight boat, it's really close, we don't know if it's going to get passed or not. The 234 to 200 is a very wide margin in the House of Representatives. So for them to say it's a close vote was just lying to us to think that maybe our wishes might be satisfied until it was too late to change them. Why did he use your money to buy those votes? Because you let him. You pay taxes. <laughs> when I say you give them, I mean it. I don't pay for it anymore. My, my question is, were you there... Excuse me. My question is, were you there on the day that Lewis Bean, the uh, reporter for the, uh, uh, it's another one of the papers, uh, I can't think of it, but anyway, he was, he was working for them, and uh, Jubilee, he was the Jubilee, Jubilee. Right, right. Yeah. were you there when he asked that question about, is martial law part of the next, uh, I was outside, and Lewis uh, was staying with some friends of mine, uh, the same people who were attacking me around, you know, I spent a few hours talking, uh, I did hear it on the press conference, uh, tapes that were taken up down just What was the general reaction of the people in the, in the room at that time? Uh, they all looked at Lewis. In fact, it was kind of interesting because uh, everybody stared at Lewis. It was just the whole place stopped. And uh, then uh, Melissa Sims, who was the blonde-haired lady you saw frequently in the press conferences, as if you got the right angle of view, she was with Waco PD and she was in charge of the press conferences. She got a couple of officers and whispered to them, and they went over to Lewis and grabbed him and escorted him out. Um, his question was, is this a police state? The answer was basically a no, but when he got outside, he refused to go any further, so they drew their guns. So they answered his question. It is a police state. There's no doubt about that. Um, Cook Lyons is defending him in an action, or representing him in an action he's taking against the Waco PD. They did drop the charges against him. My second question was, do you know who it was that instituted the idea of using psychological warfare against them? I have no idea, but I think that it was pretty appalling that uh, probably the psych warfare people in, or is it, uh, somewhere in Virginia, the Fort Hollywood in Maryland, I guess it is, was a psych warfare school. Uh, I'm sure the tactics are some that uh, the government has planned a long time to use because they plan to use them in foreign countries and we've become a foreign country to them. Um, they were appalling. I mean, when we talk about child uh, abuse, they were intended for sleep deprivation, which was one of, is one of the key elements of uh, brainwashing. Uh, they were uh, to be psychologically stressing, uh, which kind of screws up your thinking, your rational thinking process. So what they did was uh, was really appalling, and it was the epitome of child abuse until they proved that they would burn children to death. And that became the epitome of child abuse in this country. Okay, we got uh, one more question back here. Just a minute, let me uh, come back here. We're going to probably break this up pretty quick, folks, because I know that you're getting tired of a little bit restless, because it is been a long meeting. And as uh, much as uh, Gary had to say, so looking, you're right, Gary, you probably could go on all night. You got a lot of information. Yeah, I got, I, I wanted to ask a question about the discrepancies of the two videos. And, uh, my question is, what what I was hoping that maybe Linda Thompson would show up and, and would maybe answer some of this, and maybe you and her could go back and forth about it. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, what is her explanation to your video? Okay? Yeah. I, I've been very hard to read, you know, uh, see if I, I have her video at home. And, uh, well, if you go on her video, you'll see this is the same footage that she has. Um, I talked to Linda Thompson, except for two, with two exceptions, I talked to Linda Thompson last in uh, Waco, Texas, on April 3rd. 
about two months ago, I was up on the Golden Hill Producer Reservation in Connecticut, and I received a fax from a group called ANN. Not AEN, but ANN. Uh, that fax told the story of an ambush in Waco and a number of other things and began uh, adding names to the list of government agents, according to Linda Thompson. I sent a letter back or a fax back to ANN saying I would like to speak to the reporter because I don't think he has his fax straight. He hasn't investigated the other side of the story. The next day I received a phone call from Linda Thompson who denied knowing who ANN was but accusing uh, me of, or, well, she seemed to have my letter, my fax in front of her as she was attacking me. I'll uh, tell you what she reminded me of, my ex-wife, and that's why she's my ex-wife. <laughs> the next day, Linda Thompson was scheduled on the Lou Upton Show in Las Vegas. Now, Lou, I've, I've been on his show a number of times during Waco and since then about the Indian situation. And so I called Lou and said, look, Lou, I, I, well, I talked to Donahue and uh, many other talk show hosts. They asked me to come on to talk about Linda, and I said, I oh, won't come on and talk about Linda. You get Linda on, and we'll sit down and talk. And then people can judge for themselves. And Linda's always come up with excuses when I finish this project. I'm doing a video when that's done to the talk show host. In fact, Tom Donahue talks about it frequently now. Uh, Lou agreed then that he would uh, have Linda on as it was scheduled and allow me to come on the show. Uh, those tapes, uh, I guess we got some, and they were a rather interesting show because um, Linda got rather upset that she had to talk with me and discuss the issues in a forum where people could make judgments rather than just listening to her. But since then, I have not spoken to Linda. I'd like to, I was hoping she'd come tonight, too. I'd like to find out what her reaction with, uh, to this is. But my concern in bringing this out is we can't win without truth. I would like to hear what she has to say. Maybe we've made an error, but this appears to be the identical footage she has. Ken Fawcett gave her the footage. Ken Foster told me a few months ago that if I saw the next 10 to 15 seconds of her footage, I would know it's not a flamethrower. Ken Foster gave me this footage. Now I know it's not a flamethrower. I would like to hear her answer. I don't know what it could be. It would be speculation to guess why she chose to cut the video at that point. Okay. Uh, maybe we can take just one more question, and then we, we really need to, to uh, wrap this thing up tonight, Gary. Do we have to get out of the room? or uh, No, actually. You're uh, running out of batteries. <laughs> a little bit of a little. <laughs> no, actually, what it is is. Uh, well, are we making around with anybody else? Yes. The questions will just be off the. Yeah. Go again. Uh, what is happening here in Connecticut? Uh, World Health Statistic Nation. Sovereign Indian tribe, not recognized by the federal government because they were recognized by the state of Connecticut before there was a federal government. Uh, about five months ago, I guess four or five months ago, in 2020, there was a program about the Golden Health of Music and a chief named Quiet Hawk who had filed a land claim against the quarter of the state of Connecticut. Well, it covers large spots all over the state, a pretty substantial amount of the state. Well, the chief I went to see in the reservation I was on, it was a reservation where the Indians, like they do in Arizona uh, and many other states, they sell cigarettes without collecting taxes. They're exempt from taxation. So Moon Face Bear, another chief, Quiet Hawk's brother, has a 106-acre reservation just outside of Colchester. He was selling cigarettes, and Governor Weicker and Attorney General Saudi had issued an arrest warrant for Moon Face Bear for selling cigarettes and not, not getting a permit and not collecting the state's taxes. Well, I talked to a few people up there before I went up there, and something seemed awful fishy, but I saw the 2020 program just before I went. And they didn't really separate the issues. When I got up there, we started sending out the press releases, and we brought some of them up here, and found out something interesting. Quiet Hawk doesn't represent the tribe. Now, it took about a month and a half for them to finally prove that, because Moonface had gone into the circuit court and said, Quiet Hawk doesn't represent the tribe, and these land claims are illegal because there's no validity to them, and they're illegal also because the tribe does not bring an action against these people for, for the land. The court finally ruled that uh, Moonface was the leader of the tribe, tribe, not Quiet Hawk, and that uh, 
the fiscal land claims at that time. It made it kind of interesting because Riker and Taddy had said, we're charging Moon Face Bear with this crime because he doesn't represent the crimes. All of a sudden, the higher court says he represents the crime. So it means that what Taddy and Riker did the first time in accusing Moon Face of doing this on his own is invalid. Now, he hasn't gone to court for that yet, but he did finally turn himself in for arrest. I'm trying to make this real quick. I will tell you something about what occurred up there that was pretty interesting. Defiance to authority. When I arrived there, the night after I arrived, there were 20 to 20 regular state police 24 hours a day. But that night, two unmarked helicopters. When I say unmarked, I, I've never seen any, any unmarked helicopters, but you can't discern the markings. They're kind of blended in real well. But they all have tail numbers on them. They flew over at night with no lights, no beacons, no running lights, no strobes, nothing. Except every once in a while they turn on these spotlights. When some of the people left the reservation that night, down the road by Norwich High School, they saw 40 or 50 uh, state police cars parked down by the high school where the helicopters were landing. Channel 3 confirmed that. That night, we thought there was an attack, going to be an attack on the reservation. If you've heard of my famous picnic facts, it went out that night. Um, a week prior to my arrival, the state police and the SWAT teams and everything at the Circle Reservation. On that occasion, the Indians locked and loaded and hid behind logs and stood defiantly against this intimidation, this, this force of authority. What they did by standing defiantly against that intimidation and that force of authority is we would create a situation whereby time would pass, things could be achieved like the establishment of Moon Face Bear as the rightful chief of the tribe. That defiance kept them out of the situation as, uh, that occurred in Waco, Texas. So remember that defiance against that authority is a tool. In fact, Waco, April 19th, I said there's no peaceful solution. After watching the Indians, I begin again to have hope that there is a peaceful solution, but I, can, I know this can only come if we're defiant against that authority and willing to give our lives in the name of the cause. But that's what happened briefly in Connecticut. When, when did that happen? When did it take place where they were blinded? Who was? Who was after that 20 the, well, the 2020 came on about the time. Uh, I went up there the week after the tw uh, 2020 episode. About the time that was on was when the standoff was occurring between the SWAT teams and state police and the Indians. The Indians were on, there was an armed presence the entire siege. From, actually, from the first part of July all the way through until about three weeks ago when the chief turned himself in. Without cancer, without hoopla. It did cost the state $465,000 to make that arrest. And when it finally came down to it and the politics and the nature had changed, Moon Face Sheriff called up Sergeant Renzi, who we befriended because he recognized the right of Indians. He was a state policeman. Renzi drove out to the reservation. Moonface and Spirit got in the car, no handcuffs, no hoopla, went down to the magistrate, paid the bail, stopped at family pizza for the first time he'd been off reservation, had a pizza, the people in town were looking, what happened? Moonface is out, and then went back to the reservation. So $465,000 in assertion of authority, and it was destroyed as far as an effective tool of government because of the defiance of the Indians. Okay. <laughs> you got it. Your money, not mine. All right. I'll tell you what we're going to do, folks. We're going to let Gary answer some questions when we get done here. If you have some questions for him, uh, what I'd like to have you do. First of all, let's let's have a big round of applause for you. Right? This is a fantastic, fantastic job. Two <laughs>
According to the 